Well, let me also say good morning and welcome to everybody who's here today. And we are continuing a series entitled Just Ask. And if you saw that last question, I heard this expression a while ago, that you know who your true friends are on moving day. They are the ones who show up. Others don't feel so well on that day. Here's what we're doing in this series. We are looking at some questions that Jesus was asked. And his response to those questions is helping us to understand what kind of people is he inviting us, calling us, shaping us, molding us to become? What kind of church should Washington Heights become? What are the things that we should care about? And you, if you've been around for any length of time, you know that we talk about love God, love people, serve the world, and invite a friend. And we began in week one, how do I love God? And we discovered it doesn't begin with me, it begins with him and his love for us is what gets all of that rolling. Last week, we looked at how do I love others? And a lot of times we put lines and boundaries in place for that. And Jesus told a story that removed a lot of those boundaries and invited us to just simply to do it, to get involved. And today we're going to look at this whole issue of serve the world. How do I serve the world? And my guess is when we ask that question up front, you might respond with, you know, sort of a shopping list or some things to do. And yet the story that we're going to look at today and the question that Jesus gets asked takes us beneath the surface of a list and really helps us to understand more of the heart that is behind whatever we do for God's sake. I came across something not that long ago that can help us to begin move in that direction. A group of people who were 95 years old and up were asked um, this question. If you had to do it all over again, what would you do? And you know when you're 95 or up, you have some time to think. You're kind of looking at, you know, the end of your time here at, you know, some point and I would think this is kind of an expert group to think about this. And again, we might think, well, okay, they're going to give us real specific things. I think those who have the capability to reflect well go beneath the surface of that. And that's what they did. They said, I would reflect more on what I'm doing rather than simply just do it. Second, they would risk more. They wouldn't play it quite as safe as they did. And then finally, and especially I think this is insightful, do more things that would live on after I'm gone. I would be involved in things that are about a bigger picture than just me and what happens in a moment. I would be involved in things that aren't about just time and place. Things that matter. You know, whether I'm here or even afterwards. And so let's jump into this story, and as the story unfolds, I'm going to give you a little bit of a confession right up front. When the question is asked, I think if you especially have been with us the first couple of weeks, you know that Jesus often takes it in a different direction than the people who ask the question, we're going to see that again today. But I'll be honest with you, when this question is first asked, I kind of get it. I agree a little bit with this question that is asked, but Jesus is going to reshape this and I find this an extremely challenging question, and I hope and pray that you find a challenge there as well. So here's the story. Meanwhile, this is Mark chapter 14, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. Leprosy has been around for a long time. It's uh, often referred to in our day as Hansen's disease, named after the scientist who discovered a very slow-growing bacteria that actually causes that disease. And this is somebody who we're told used to have that. And a lot of the commentators believe that this is one of the many people that Jesus healed during his three years of carrying out a public ministry. And so if that was the case, imagine being somebody who had that horrible disease that put you on the outside of culture. You were untouchable. You couldn't gather in a place like this to worship God. You were on your own, maybe with just other lepers. That was it. Now he's well. 
And he's hosting this gathering at his house. And if he has been healed, I wonder if this is a thank you, Jesus, would you come to my house and we're going to invite some other people and, you know, we're just, we're just going to celebrate. Imagine what it'd be like to live on the other side of having that kind of disease. All of a sudden, something happens that's a bit unusual. While he, Jesus, was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard. Nard just sounds nasty, doesn't it? <laughs> Rhymes with lard. Doesn't sound like, you know, there's anything good there. Any nard fans in the audience here? No. Um, nard is unusual to us. It was the product of tiny little flowers that grew on the tops of mountains in the Middle Eastern part of the world. There was very little of that liquid inside of one of those tiny flowers, and so to have any amount of that would be a very lucrative sort of thing. It would be something very, very expensive. And so the woman walks in, and she takes that, she broke the jar and poured the perfume over his, over Jesus' head. Now, a couple things, just culturally speaking, two things that would not have seemed as unusual to people then um, by what happens there. It seemed very unusual to us. But, you know, people didn't bathe all that much back then, and so perfume or sweet-smelling things were often used as a substitute for that. And maybe some of you now can think of somebody who needs some nard, you know, and uh, feel free to... <laughs> Make that suggestion to him. The other thing that came along with that is when bodies were being prepared for burial, they would often be covered with a perfume. Why? Just honestly to keep the smell of a dead body at bay. And so those two things were pretty commonly understood in that day. So here comes a woman who carries out what seems to us very, very unusual. And look at the response of that. Some of those at the table were indignant. Indignant means mad, upset. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. And here's where I'll say again, there's a part of me that understands that question. Why would you do that? And there are so many other things you could have done with that. If you want to do something good with it, we discover a little bit, you know, in the next couple of verses here, this is about a year's worth of wages. You know, I did a little research. I think this is true. The median household income in Utah right now, $65,000. Imagine if somebody walked in here, took $65,000 worth of some fluid and, you know, just poured it out in that kind of way. I think we'd go... Hey, wait a minute. There's so many people that are in need around here. There are so many opportunities to get that in play. And that's why there's a part of me that says, I understand that question. And there's a part of me that might ask the same question. And you know why that is? Because I believe we live in a very calculating culture. And a lot of times we think about ROI, return on investment. And if I put this into play, what will be coming back in the other direction? But this is not really, as Jesus is going to define it, an ROI moment. That's not what's happening. But isn't it true that many times we carry something out and there can be this thought that runs through our minds of, and what will be done in return? How will this benefit me? How will it be sort of a positive thing in a bigger picture here? But this story isn't about one of those moments. It's about a moment of somebody whose heart behind this, Jesus is about to open up in front of us. But before I take a look at that, I also did a little research. The number one most expensive perfume in the world right now is this one. And I better get the name right. This is Clive Christian Number no. 1 Imperial Majesty Perfume. It goes for $12,721.89 per ounce. And there are a number of ounces in here. That bottle that you see goes for a cool $215,000. So guys, if you're looking for that special something, <laughs> don't say you didn't know, okay, because now you know. But those around the table express what I think, you know, I've already shared with you as this story goes on. 
That perfume could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And we could probably come up with 10 other things that would be just as valuable, just as important as, as what's mentioned there. Do you know how many people that could have helped? Do you know what impact that could have had if you had leveraged that in another way? And now it's Jesus' turn to respond. And just like all the other questions that he's been asked through this, we're going to see Jesus, who is the master of life, talk about things in ways that we often don't talk about them. But boy, we would be wise to pay attention. Because he is about to help us understand something about whatever it is that we do that is vital to us really being in tune with what he's inviting us to become. So here comes his response. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? Now for us, a good thing, we might think, well, a good deed, a kind deed. And a lot of times, again, we can have motivations where we do something good, but we might even be thinking about what the outcome of that might be, even some recognition, some praise, some sense in which people see us, you know, as a good person. But the word that Jesus uses for good is not just something that benefits another. This means something inherently, intrinsically good and right all on its own, and it just stands there all by itself. It is not calculating what kind of response will come, what kind of applause will be offered, what kind of recognition comes along with it. It is simply the right thing, a good thing. You could also use the word a beautiful thing. And sometimes beauty is just good and right simply because it's beautiful. We say, well, what is the practical value? It's just good. It's just right. And in this moment, that's what Jesus is saying about what she did. He goes on to say this, you will always have the poor among you. Does Jesus not care about the poor? Well, yeah, he does. But he's simply making a statement of fact that in this broken world of ours, there will always be need. No one thing will bring an end to that or cure all of that. And you can help them whenever you want to. Interesting how there will always be critics, right? There will always be somebody in the room that when somebody does something, they have a better idea. We're not going to do anything about it, but you know what she could have done? She could have done something so much better. At least that's my opinion. What are you going to do? And so in this moment, Jesus says, you know, you can help them whenever you want to, but you will not always have me. What is he talking about? Jesus has been very upfront, very clear that his days are numbered, that he will allow himself to be arrested, falsely tried, allow himself to be led away to be nailed to a Roman cross and die, and he wasn't doing it just because he could. He wasn't doing it just so we could see it. He was doing it to take our place to take the hit for all your sin and my sin, all the things that junk us up and separate us from a holy God. And then on the third day after that, he was going to rise again from the dead. And he has been very upfront. But people didn't understand it because nobody has ever seen that. But Jesus made it quite clear. And what he begins to hint at in this moment is that there is somebody who understands that. Maybe they've heard it. Maybe they've come to know it. But now they believe not only who Jesus is, but what is going to happen to him and what he said is true. And that was not an automatic thing. Because there were times even those who were his followers, his disciples, who spent every day with him for three years and heard him talk about this on a number of occasions said, no, 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 Jesus, you got to stop that crazy talk about you dying because this is going up and to the right and you're you're famous, and if you are famous, we're kind of along with that. And one day, Peter even says, let it never be so that you're going to die on a cross. And you know what Jesus says in response? Get behind me, Satan. 
Here's just a tip. Whenever Jesus calls you Satan, you're on the wrong page, okay? You're just, <laughs> you're just not in the right place. But sometimes we can think that way, right? We calculate it, and we think about it from all of our human perspectives. And maybe even we factor ourselves into the picture and we wonder how it's going to go well for me, myself, and I. But here's somebody on this day doing something different. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. Did she understand? Did she know it was coming? From Jesus' perspective, someone who just simply did a good thing, he connects to so many other things that are part of a much bigger picture than any of us see at any one given moment. And then he concludes with this, I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. Now, did she know on that day, here we would be 2,000 years later in little old northern Utah talking about what she did? No, she simply did a good thing. Something that wasn't attached and connected all the dots and had thought through all the implications and especially on a personal level, she just did it. And Jesus makes this amazing statement. She has done what she could. She's done what she could. With motives unattached, to whatever is coming back on the other side of that. She just simply did it. And I think a good question for us to ask is this question, well, why? What motivated her to do this? And we're not given her name here. It just says a woman came in. Well, in one of the other accounts of the life and times of Jesus in this world, this was Mark we've been reading from. John records um, also Um, his record of time spent together with Jesus. And in John chapter 12, he records the same event and he gives us a little bit more detail and he includes the name of this woman and her name is Mary. Now, if you know anything about the Bible, there's a bunch of Marys in there and I get it, that's a little bit confusing. There's some Josephs in there, some Johns in there and there's a bunch of Marys. And this is not Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is Mary who has a sister named Martha and they had a brother named Lazarus. And right before this event happened, do you know what Jesus did in the life of their family? He gets word that his friend Lazarus is so sick that he's at the point of dying. Jesus, would you come? And you know what happens? Jesus is late, at least from our perspective. He doesn't show up when he's summoned. And he shows up four days after his friend has passed away. And the two sisters, Mary and Martha, they go out to Jesus and separately, they basically say the same thing to them. And it's the same thing that we've said in a number of different ways. If you had been here, my brother would still be alive. And you know what Jesus does on that day? He doesn't shut them down for their raw emotion in the middle of grief. He goes over to the tomb where his friend has been laid. And John records for us a whole bunch of miracles that Jesus performed, and he uses a special word to describe each and every one of them. He calls them a sign. Jesus wasn't here to put on a magic show. Whenever Jesus performed a miracle, it was a sign. It was an indicator. It was something revealing who he is and what he is here to do. And Jesus walks over to the tomb, tells them to roll the stone aside, and they say, that's not a bad idea or a good idea. It's a bad idea because he's been in there four days. It's not going to smell real good. Roll the stone aside, and he calls out his friend, and Lazarus walks out alive. What's the sign that Jesus was giving? That he has power over life and death. And it's not even hard for him. He can just say a name. And they're alive again. And then this event happens just a few days later. And here comes Mary, one of those sisters who has seen her brother walk out of a tomb after he was laid to rest. And she takes this expensive perfume and she pours it out over Jesus and he says it was good and what 
was she doing that day? She has just had a powerful experience of who Jesus is and what he can accomplish. And what she offers is a simple, heartfelt response. She is so in awe, so amazed by who Jesus is. She just responds. And Jesus clues us in. She didn't think it all through and try to, you know, factor herself into the whole picture of all of that. She just does it because she says, in light of who you are and in light of what you have done and all that can be found in you, I'm just going to respond. And so she does. And she wants to do something that expresses a simple, heartfelt response to who Jesus is and what he's done. Here's another way to talk about that. Bless people, bless people. People who have experienced the goodness and the power and the grace of God, you know what? They respond. And it's so vital for us to understand this because so often the way that we think, and again, maybe I'm talking more about myself than anybody else, we think, well, okay, when it comes, you know, to being in a relationship with God, I guess there are some things I have to do. Maybe I think I'm earning God's favor. Maybe I think I'm paying off some kind of debt. Maybe I think I'm in a bartering relationship with God and he did something. Now I got to do something. Maybe we view serving as a chore. Did you have a chore when you were growing up? I did. Yeah, I had a few of them. One of them was taking out the garbage. And the thing that happens with chores is a lot of times we don't like them. We just got to do it, right? Because we're in the family. Well, I kind of liked taking out the garbage. You know why? Because I was able to burn it. That's why. <laughs> and there's this fire thing with little boys that begins to wane when we turn about 90, 91, somewhere around there. And it just doesn't seem as important anymore. But for the most part, we, we might think that serving is, well, okay, it's a responsibility, it's a burden, it's, I, it's something I have to do. This whole story says, oh, it is anything but that. It is a simple, heartfelt response to what we've come to know and understand and experience about who Jesus is. And if we have been blessed, you know what? We seek to bless. It just makes sense. And so on this day, when people are saying, you know what, there are so many more ways in which that could have been leveraged. Jesus says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Sometimes it's not about leverage. Sometimes it's not about calculating all the responses in advance. Sometimes it's just good. It's just right. It's just beautiful. All by itself. And there's something that I think informs us about this whole arena and what happens on that day that also is very important to our understanding when it comes to serving because what we can often do is we can focus a whole lot more on what we do not have. And I think this story tells us, stop worrying about what you're not and start giving what you are. And I don't know about you, but there are things when I look at myself, I say, man, I'm not this, I'm not that, I don't have that. Why even bother? I'll give you one example. I am a dyed-in-the-wool, all-my-life introvert. And I've come to conclude God loves us introverts too. You know, despite, you know, the things that we have with being around people, and I can play the extrovert, but it exhausts me. And trust me, there are many Sunday afternoons I go home, and you know what? I don't even see the second half of the Cowboy game. I'm sleeping. All right, I'm napping. <laughs> because it wears me out. And when I see people who do what I do, and I see them as extroverts, I think, you know what? That makes a whole lot more sense, God. <laughs> that just seems like the right fit, God. Why do I have to be an introvert when it seems like it makes so much more sense that it would be an extrovert? People get amped up in the middle of that kind of environment. Other people get trained. Why would you do that? You know what I've come to conclude is, yeah, there are many things that I am not. But I can give God what I am. 
And every single one of us in this room, you know what? We've got strengths, probably not even a ton of them, things that we're really good at. And then there's a whole bunch of things that we're not good at. My guess is we've all had this experience. We look at somebody else who does something that we do or something like what we do, and we go, man, I can never do that. And I think that can lead us in the direction of saying, well, then why even bother? Because when it comes, you know, to the capabilities that, you know, people have around me, I mean, <laughs> there are so many more, you know, than I have. Stop worrying about what you are not. And start giving God what you are. And you know, when I was growing up, the thinking went something like this. You have strengths, you have weaknesses. And one of your missions in life is to bolster up, to strengthen as many of those weaknesses as you can. Thankfully, in our day, that thinking is shifting. Now, people like Marcus Buckingham and others, even just in our culture, would say, you know what? Don't worry about your weaknesses that much. Build on your strengths. And do what you're good at doing. And that there's so much more opportunity in that arena. But so often what we do is we shut down because we're so much more worried about what we're not rather than focusing on what we are. Remember Jesus' statement about her? She did what she could. Did she have it all? No. She did what she could. So let me ask you a couple questions as we think about all of this. How can I respond to God's grace? In light of who you have come to know and to experience as the Jesus of the Bible, how do we respond to that? When was the last time just from a simple heartfelt desire to say, God, I've seen you in action. I've seen your goodness and your power at work either in me or around me. And I'm not just going to think it all through. I'm just simply going to respond. When was the last time that happened? Because there should be times and places and ways in which it does. Second question, what can I do? Not what can I do. What can I do? And there are gifts and talents and abilities that God has entrusted to you. And I would suggest to you that your opportunity to bless people in response to what God has blessed you with lies in the arena of that. What can I do? And then final question here, what am I doing that will outlive me? And you know, I am part of a lot of funerals and get to hear a lot of people talk when others have passed away. And I got to tell you, the things that are talked about on those days are not a shopping list of things that that person did. What's talked about is the heart behind whatever it is that they did. Those are the things that live on. And so if we wonder, well, how can I serve the world? What's the shopping list for that? What's the to-do list for that? Before we get to any list, it really begins with a heart that just is finding a simple, heartfelt response to the goodness and the grace of God. I came across this story about a group of people in Sarajevo. And I had the opportunity to be there a number of years ago, and if you know anything, back in the 1990s, there was a horrible conflict there. Yugoslavia was broken up into some different groups and, and different nations, and it was one of the more recent and darker episodes of what is often referred to as ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing is a clean term for something not clean. It is one group trying to exterminate another group. And man's inhumanity to man just seems to know no bounds. And in Sarajevo, as you fly in from the air, there are these two hillsides that are just covered with white, and you can't tell what it is at a high altitude. But when you get down in there, you discover that they are grave markers. And in one, there was about 15, 17,000 graves. And on the other one, there was about 12,000 graves. And they say, yeah, those are just the ones that have been recovered. They're just bodies everywhere. 
in the middle of the war, the conflict there, there was a group of people that would go to different parts of the city at great risk to themselves. There were snipers all over the place. It was just completely unsafe. Places were mined. And you know what they were doing? They were planting roses. And there was a correspondent for a news agency that came upon that group, and they were going out to plant some roses. And basically, the correspondent asked a question that probably seems pretty natural to us, at least in life as we understand it. How can you be planting roses in the middle of this? I mean, it's coming apart. There are bodies in the street. How can you be planting roses? And their answer is very simple, similar to the outcome of the story. You know what they said? How can we not plant roses? That there's a time and a place, especially in a broken world, where there is something that doesn't have all the dots connected and all the calculations have not been run where something is beautiful all by itself and what it points us to is something other than what we see. And on this day, Jesus points us in that kind of direction. And says, you know what? When there is a simple, heartfelt response to who God is, it's good. And by good, he means intrinsically, inherently good all by itself. And it isn't about what's coming back. It's just right. And if you may be here and wondering, you know, well, how can we do that? I do have some things for you to consider. But behind whatever it is that we do, it really is about a heart seeking to respond to who Jesus is and what he's done. That connection card that Jimmy was talking about before on the back today, we put four of the huge need areas in our church right now. They are growing and it is exciting, but you know what? It really isn't about need. What we really long for is people who say, you know what? In light of who Jesus is, in light of what he's done, I just want to respond you'd like to find out more about one of those areas, children, students, worship, or tech, we would love to talk with you. And it's not a pressure thing, and it's not a forever thing. If it's a right fit for you, that is great. And we would love to have that conversation with you. But we value serving the world. Why? It is simply a heartfelt response to all that God has done. We were singing it before, right? Jesus, our living hope. And because that is true, let's find all kinds of ways to simply respond because it's good, it's right, it's beautiful, all on its own. Would you pray together with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are. And forgive us for the times in which we even make our involvement with you about us. And God, I pray that there would be moments in which there is a deep sense of just awe and wonder at who you are and all that you can do. And as amazing as it is that you would call somebody out from a tomb and make them alive again, God, the greatest miracle of all is when you take somebody completely unworthy before a holy God and you forgive them and make them right, not because they become worthy, but because they put hope and trust in you. And if we've taken that step of faith and trust, God, that's our story. That's where we are. That's who we are. And so, God, may there be times in which we just simply respond to that because it's right. And, God, we thank you for the many ways in which you bless us as a church and also as individuals. And, God, we thank you that in a world that can often be dark, that there are so many opportunities to plant a little bit of light 
that ultimately points to you, who you are, and the things that you have done. And may all of that, God, be for your honor and for your glory. And so we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.